Cool, thanks, Sean. Um, so as Sean said, I head up a team in the Ministry of Justice called Youth Centred Policy Design. Um, and I think I really wanted to talk about this subject because a lot of what we do uh, within that team is really collaborating with policymakers uh, and other disciplines in the Ministry of Justice and also across government. Um, I think that's quite interesting because when we actually look at users and their journeys, they're often not bounded by government departments. Uh, and that's something we can we can return to in the discussion. Um, we're going to start with a presentation, uh, which should or it will centre around what happens, what we found happens when you get really good uh, collaboration from all kinds of disciplines within a policy space um, and do some really interesting service design. And the opportunities and options that that opens up for policymakers. Um, and then hopefully the discussion we can have can be about how do we get to that point. Uh, but really, I'd be you know we'll go where you guys are interested. Um, but for context, I'll I'll start with this presentation. So I'll just share my screen. Let's hope this works. Okay, cool. So I was going to walk you through this presentation, really, guys. So um, just as this is potentially a bit of an international call, I'll introduce what the Ministry of Justice in the UK does. Um, the Ministry of Justice in the UK looks after prisons and courts mainly, but also a plethora of other agencies, so things like legal aid uh, or family court staff uh, that, that help the courts deliver uh, their services. Um, it doesn't include the police, which is quite interesting um, for um, justice as a department. Um, and as a system, there's lots of dependencies elsewhere in government. Um, a lot of people end up in the justice system because they are um, failed elsewhere in education, um, for example, um, in local housing, for example. Um, and so we experience a lot of what we might term failure demand because people end up in, in this system um, because of things happening elsewhere. So I'll introduce you now to some of our users to give you an idea of the kind of complexities of working in the Ministry of Justice. So some of our users uh, look like this. Um, so one of the teams that we're working with is the Youth Justice Policy Team uh, and the Youth um, Estate. Uh, and it's a very small population of young people that, that are in that state, but they're a very, very complex set of people. Um, there's a large portion of people with mental health needs, overrepresented uh, group of BAME young people, and a really high proportion of people with special education needs as well. And as a result of not really meeting these needs very well in custody, more than half of those people go on and reoffend uh, within a year of leaving custody. And that's why we're operating that space, because it's, it's such an opportunity to help people rehabilitate. Um, we're also working with teams that look after people that go to court. Um, there's about 50,000 people that go to court every year to make child arrangements. Uh, and to give you an idea of those people, um, most of them are young parents um, looking after younger children and most, more than half of them don't have access to a lawyer. What that means is an indicator really of uh, how much uh, disposable income they've got, so they've got less disposable income. We've also got to think about in this space that um, we know 25% of women will experience domestic violence and abuse in their lifetime, and a large proportion of those people don't necessarily know that they are uh, victims of domestic violence and abuse. And so when we design services and policies, we have to make sure we're keeping people safe in this system. Um, and the particular problem that we look at with families is that actually 25% of them probably don't need to be in court and going to court leads to a really poor experience for them and actually worse outcomes for their families. Um, and this is also a big group of people that we're working with as well, um, people affected by crime. And a really big focus for us at the moment is victims of major incidents or serious crimes. Um, and that could be anyone, it can happen to absolutely anyone, um, as we kind of, you know, sadly found out last year with terror attacks in Manchester, and London. Um, so we're involved in trying to design services and policies that can better support those people. And again, as you can imagine, there's a lot of cross government themes there where we only, as the Ministry of Justice, look after a little part of that. So really what we're designing for is people in crisis. Um, which is something a colleague in Canadian Government Services, Kylie, uh, spoke about and which we really adopted at the Ministry of Justice. We've, got, we've really got to become experts at designing for those people. Uh, if you compare the services the Ministry of Justice office, offers compared to, for example, uh, applying for a driver's licence, 
I've got a very different type of person. Um, and one of those people is in way more crisis than the other crisis in the other um, and that has really impacts on how you design services for those people um, and how we're doing that in the Ministry of Justice designing for people in crisis is by saying we need to make sure that the right people are working on the right problem space in the past um, we've kind of been really kind of constrained by what people are available rather than trying to fit the right skills to the right problem space Policy managers really look after the problem for ministers um, and they're already pretty adept at uh, drawing in specialist skills when they need them. They draw in lawyers, they draw in operational staff, for example, um, social researchers all the time when they make policy. But what they're not particularly good at is uh, drawing in new skill sets. Things like user-centered design, which is what I look after, digital um, and data science, external academics, things like that. And so when we're talking about multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary teams in the MEJ, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about empowered policy managers that can bring in the right specialists at the right time to design policy and services that meet the needs of their users and the policy objectives. And our mission is to try and enable that. The reason that this hasn't worked very well uh, to date is by nobody's fault. It's because we largely think policy managers aren't particularly aware of those specialist skills in government. Um, and so they can't really assess where they add value in the policy making cycle and therefore use them. And indeed those specialists in government don't really understand policy making uh, and so they can't really do very much of the same back, which leads to a bit of a disconnect and that's the problem we're trying to solve by being multidisciplinary. And what we're trying to do is target where we use those skill sets uh, and we're trying to target these kind of spaces, these highly complex, highly unknown spaces where we don't know the answers up front and we need to do some exploring, we need to find new evidence to find solutions. So what happens when you do that successfully? Um, well, I'm going to present to you a bit of a case study, uh, which is family justice. So we've been working in the family justice space for about two years. Um, so it's one of our more mature uh, service areas where we're working together in a multidisciplinary way. And we've had some really cool, I think, and awesome results as a result of that. And um, it's a really big success story, I think, in the Ministry of Justice, um, for what, it, what happens when you start collaborating across disciplines and start using new disciplines um, within a traditional policymaking area. So start with uh, my team, we're the user-centered design experts. Um, just to give you an idea what user-centered design is, um, what we try and do is we try and speak to end users to understand their needs. By understanding their needs, we can design for them. If we don't understand end users' needs, we can't design for them. We also involve people on the front line and users themselves in actually building solutions. Um, and we also fill this gap between policy idea and um, implementation or pilot, where we're able to build confidence over what works with really um, cheap, fast experiments and prototypes. So that's really probing around to find out, to build confidence over solutions and reduce risk before committing to something larger scale. So our mission is to improve decision making by putting users and their journeys at the heart of new policy development. So understanding users um, and testing and experimenting to fill that gap. And that's where those skills of user centered design really fit into the policy making cycle, we think. The reason we think that's important is this. We, don't, we just don't know the answer uh, for a lot of these policy questions, these wicked problems. So we need skills that allow us to understand the users and um, reduce uncertainty by doing experiments and prototyping and probing. And that's exactly what we've been doing with family justice. Um, so this was a kind of a service blueprint that emerged about 18 months ago and people said this is this is the answer this is the thing that's going to solve it for families we're going to reduce the number of people who go to court unnecessarily by implementing this um, and we looked at this and we said oh there's some key assumptions there particularly around this assessment model so let's test that but but let's test it really quickly and to see what we get out of that so what we did was we uh, put together what we call cognitive walkthrough um, and that um, was put together in about two weeks. We tested that in focus groups over the next two weeks with people going through the separation process. We did that by basically building screens like this, which um, brought out some of the things that we wanted to test um, with real people in order to elicit a reaction from them. 
And by doing that, we're able to reduce some of the uncertainty. So in this screen, for example, we've said that a family advisor will contact you within three days to assess your situation. And we ask people, how do you feel about that? What, what do you think is going to happen? What do you expect from a service that does that? What's, what's good, what's bad about it? By doing this, we, we were able to find some really interesting stuff really, really fast. Um, we found, most importantly, I think, that as long as we kept caught at the end of this process, right at the very end of a process, people would do everything they could to get to court and they would tick all the boxes in order to get to court. They wouldn't necessarily be uh, really incentivized to go and resolve the dispute or work with the system. So for the policymakers, this then became a question of perception rather than process. For the policy, it became much more important to change people's perception of courts and the services that were alternatives to court rather than the process uh, around how you get there. And that was a really fundamental change in the policy. Um, and it was something that was achieved in three or four weeks through some pretty cheap, rapid prototyping around probing with, with real people uh, to try and fill that gap. So we talk about data, science, data scientists now. So we've got a team in the Ministry of Justice that uh, is a data science team, and they work very similar to us. They embed with policy teams in order to offer specialist skills. And their mission, mission is um, to provide new insights to policymakers um, and help decision makers uh, by gathering new data sets and also, uh, really interestingly, providing the front line with better decision to make, um, better evidence to make decisions. A really great example of where we've done that in the family justice space is by matching big data sets between the Ministry of Justice and the Department for Education. Uh, we've looked at families that go through court um, and then we've matched that against pupil attainment level uh, and data that's held by the Department for Education. By doing that, we've been able to show that there is a negative impact um, for families on children that go to court, which has really helped to beef up the policy rationale behind why we're trying to divert people uh, to services that are appropriate for them. But it's only by matching those two sets of data that normally sit separately that we're able to build that insight. Interestingly as well, we're also starting to investigate the, um, the power of kind of automation and machine learning and AI. So CAFCAS is a frontline agency that works with the courts and they provide reports to judges about how to um, sentence basically, how to make a decision for families. And most of CAFCAS is an operational agency. And one of the things we start to think about is whether we can look at CAFCAS case files uh, and all the qualitative data that they uh, take about people when making assessment and start to build patterns. So can we, can we learn patterns and match those to outcomes? The really powerful thing that that might lead to is it might lead to better inform, informed judges and better informed interventions for people. So in the family court, we think up to a third of people return to court, for example, um, and therefore they, the court hasn't really done its job. What would be really interesting is if we could match um, patterns that might lead to um, that might indicate that people are more likely to return to court, um, which might therefore inform how we uh, provide parenting plans for people. So the people who are display characteristics, which mean they're more likely to return to court, might offer a different intervention than a court hearing itself. Because if they return to court within a year, uh, then that might not be the best thing for them and their family. Finally, I'm going to talk about a bit of digital expertise and how that's helped policymakers as well. So I sit in the digital team um, as well, um, and we, our mission is to help policymakers uh, be aware and use technology and digital to their advantage and when, make, and when building advice for ministers. And we're also in the business of gathering more data and real time, which we can do when services are digitized. And similar to UCD, we can test solutions really quickly and gather feedback on how effective they are. So how does that help the family justice space? Um, one of the things that the team started to do is to digitise uh, the application to courts, which was paper application. What this means is two things for the policy team. The first is that they've got access to data about 100% of their population. Building it in-house also means that they can iterate that really quickly. So if you want to gather new information or different information about people, we can start to gather that pretty fast and at pretty low cost. 
So it's really it's an opportunity to gather information about people's journeys, what people have tried before they get to court, people's satisfaction levels, and those kind of insights that can help inform policy design, service design in the future. The other thing that allows us to do though is also uh, make interventions with people uh, and to measure the effectiveness of those interventions really, really quickly. So in this space, for example, by digitizing the court application, we can provide people with nudges uh, which is in the form of contextual information, depending on what answers people give. We can't do that in a paper form because we, we don't know what answers people give until they get to court. In digital form, if people say they're not at risk of harm, for example, we can say, have you tried these alternatives? And we can also educate people on the process around court, which is much harder to do in a paper form. And through doing that, we're hoping again to make sure that the people for whom is relevant get the right information at the right time and hopefully go and investigate those alternatives and we can measure that which is really a massive advantage over having this as a paper form as well so digital therefore is uh, providing loads of new opportunities for policymakers to try and achieve their ambitions that um that aren't necessarily or haven't necessarily been available in the past so is that everyone no it's not everyone there's these people that you should think about as well you could collaborate with in your department. We, we, for example, in the Ministry of Justice have these kind of experts in our department, we've got implementation experts, academics, external academics, frontline staff are a really, really important partner in all of this. Uh, people like commissioning managers also a great deal of knowledge in their heads too. I think the, the underlying message is that, you know, what we do is we deliver through people and great delivery is through a great diversity of people is what we found. You just got one team looking at a problem then the problem is really difficult to tackle if you've got different teams different perspectives different skills it's much easier to break that problem down and start to actually deliver interventions and things that might solve that problem really really quickly so um i'd like to kind of uh, invite you guys to a little discussion either about what you've what you thought was interesting about that or indeed um some of the questions that sean has collected before this um yeah i think that conversation is the best way to go forward thanks jack and please um if you have any questions um uh, make sure to unmute yourself uh hi everyone it's dominic speaking uh, a slight disclaimer in that i have previously worked with jack at the moj a few years ago um so a lot of what he was speaking about there was familiar and resonated but can also see where things have developed and uh, also spent the last year working for a different government department who the, the whole experience was very very different shall I say so although we were both following government digital services approach to building services lots of things were different so I don't want to I guess what I'm saying is I don't want to hog too much of the time because like I said I've, I can ask questions if you kind of get other people uh, thinking about things and actually you're right so as I say that um, when he talks about collaborating with other departments, so if we were to take, to take, for example, the department I've just described, who shall remain anonymous for various reasons, if they were to collaborate, so although they might have the intention to collaborate, if the actual institutions themselves move at radically different velocities, because like, so my memory of the MOJ was it's actually really progressive because you're doing things that, that you've just been describing, whereas my experience in this other department it's very different and you kind of wonder how much of that is how far up the chain of command do you need to go to get sufficient executive backing as it were for what it is you're trying to do because it kind of felt a lot of the time on this previous project that uh you're running through treacle that kind of sensation where the situation around you or the environment around you actually prevents you from moving quickly in the right direction yeah, I mean, I think that that's definitely true. Uh, it's good to see you again, Dominic, too. <laughs> um, yeah, it's def definitely true that um, you need senior backing to do this collaborative stuff. Uh, I think we've been quite fortunate in that we've got directors, um, both policy directors and digital directors, that um, want to collaborate. Um, we've got this idea of a maturity model uh, within digital or that... Um, end-to-end -end service transformation is kind of top level of maturity. Um, so there is an ambition to do end-to-end -end service transformation. The implication of that is that one, those kind of skill sets like digital 
need to be involved right at the start of uh, what services will be transformed. Um, Balls at end to end is not um, a government department, it's often multiple government departments. Um, and so there's also an ambition to, to move outside of just working within the MHA. And so, yeah, having really, really senior backing that, that wants to collaborate is really, really important. Um, and I think we've approached that in a number of ways in the Ministry of Justice, and they're all super difficult. Um, one of those is to do kind of pilot projects, uh, which we've done with the Home Office around, for example, serious group offenders or gangs, um, where we've gone, is it, is it possible to collaborate? and to try and prove the model. Um, and that's been successful in some ways. Um, another is to use the cabinet office and GDS uh, with this idea of service communities. Um, uh, because often it's quite difficult to say, DWP need to be doing something different when you're the MHA. If you've got the center coming in, like uh, the cabinet office, they've got a lot more clout, I think, to say, we're looking at this from a helicopter view and, and you guys need to be both doing something different. Um, and we've used that approach in family justice, um, actually. So we've built a bit of a service community in family justice with DWP, DFE, um, and what used to be DCLG. Um, particularly though, what we've done is we try to reduce that down. So it's not trying to do all the things. It's just about content. And it has very specific aims that we're not trying to duplicate content. And we're trying to use our money wisely and invest wisely on the internet and elsewhere. Um, so I think that that's worked quite well, but only because it's been very reduced. The next stage is, you know, how can we actually have uh, service communities over things which are big and complex and, and potentially more problematic. Thanks, Dominic. Um, anyone else? Well, Jack, there's one that I wanted to uh, raise from the uh, questions that people asked in advance and, and from my experience in the US government as well, I think this applies. Um, how do you apply this kind of thinking when, uh, well, the environment variant in the US, it's like a government pay scale from GS9 to GS15 and the mindset is stagnant throughout grades and doing things the old way. What would be like the first step in, in taking uh, some of the initiatives that that you've laid out. Uh, yeah, sure. I should also say people, if they if they don't want to speak on the call, could ask ask questions in the text chat as well. Um, it's a bit weird speaking on a video conference, I know. Um, yeah. So when you've got a, so I think we were definitely in that space a couple of years ago, uh, maybe three or four years ago. Um, where you've got quite a lot of stagnation um, and a kind of very set way of view throughout the grades. Uh, we're quite lucky in the UK in that we've got GDS and GDS set up uh, the Ministry of Justice Digital Department, which had to begin with a, a very strong mission, which was to transform the department um, by introducing new ways of thinking and new ways of working. Uh, and that was really strong and there was buy-in at some level to do that and that was at director or director general level probably which is the most senior grade why is that department would never have really been set up um, so I think my personal experience of it after I came in after that is that you need to find allies in the department uh, if it's just you on your own as a kind of lone wolf then it's the, the odds are stacked against you in terms of actually trying to do that um, what we found is we need to find allies, we need to work with those allies. Um, and we can only really prove things by doing them, we can only really convince people by doing them. So when we started, we started in a really, really safe space uh, and we worked on some projects which weren't super high value to the department, they weren't really important to the department, um, but those were our allies that we worked with. So we worked in a safer space with people who wanted to do it in order to both explore for our own sake, because we didn't know, you know how to do it either, uh, but also to show value and experiment with what kind of value gets produced through this collaboration. So that's kind of like, I think how my experience of getting started is you, you've got to find those people who want to do something different, probably because they've got a big intrans you know, intractable problem or because they just don't have enough people to do something, which is often the case in public services. Um, work with them uh, in order to show value, but also in order to adapt how you approach those kind of problems because you know, we're still learning and we're still developing our practice. 
And so you've got to go in with that kind of mindset that you're not there to solve things, you're there to explore how to do it. Hi, this is David from Costa Rica. I have a, a quick question for you as well. Um, so, you know, everything you were just describing is super relevant to the Costa Rican case because, because for the most part, our government is, you know, swamped in bureaucracy and it's and um, sort of backward mindsets, especially at the higher levels. And so one of the things that's kind of been an interesting step for us is to just kind of skip the idea of collaborating with people within government and go straight to collaborating with people in other sectors in academia and in private sector, because then you don't have to really kind of switch mindsets. But that, that brings challenges in the sense that, um, you know, the rules of government, at least here, are, are not really, don't necessarily look as friendly, you know, very positively on collaborating with the private sector, particularly. And so I was just wondering if from the Ministry of Justice, you've had any, any reason to want to collaborate with people outside of government and how that's been? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. Um, and there's a kind of movement in UK government, which was started this year, called One Team Gov, but I think it's an international movement. So you should also look into that, which, you know, explicitly talks about how we should be collaborating with the you know, private, private sector and other sectors as well. Um, my, own experience, my own experience of it is that um, the government talks about this thing called open policy making, where you know it's got porous boundaries and people can come in and get involved, but in reality it doesn't ever really happen. Uh, and people are really you know worried about putting policies in front of people uh, early on, or and before ministers have said that that's the right thing. Um, and so it's been difficult uh, for us to try and do that. It's something we have pushed, and. The ways we've done it is by really doing stuff like this is by saying hey we're working on this problem um, does anyone want to get involved with family justice for example the case study um we had a regular demo to people um, and anyone could join that and at that demo we would say we would uh, show what we were doing what we were working on we wouldn't necessarily show any of the sensitive policy stuff but we would show things that we'd learned about users for example things that we tried with the users and we caveated everything by saying, you know, none of this is official policy or anything like that. Uh, but we just did it. We just got on and we're doing it. And uh, eventually the policy team got really, really bought into it. Um, and so we start to change hearts and minds again by doing the thing. Um, but yeah, we, we've done a little bit of it. I think what we're trying to push the MOJ at the moment to do in the UK is really trying to develop a strategy for working with those people, uh, particularly like the startup sector, uh, because the tech startup sector, I think, is doing some really interesting things that government could really benefit from, uh, but they're often, you know, fighting against um, a entrenched market. And so, for example, one of the things we're interested in is, you know, low cost legal support and advice, which the startup sector started to investigate. And we have to come up with a, our terms of engagement really for whether we're gonna get involved with that and how we can support the startup sector. Um, so yeah, we've done a little bit of it. Um, but really what we've tried to do is be as open as we can with the things that we look after versus the more sensitive things. Uh, Jack, I'll ask another one from uh, the questions that people posed in advance. Uh, with given, and this is one that we've seen a lot at Apolitical, um, given different budgets and different priorities, uh, how have you successfully gotten people from different disciplines and departments aligned and on the same page? I know you mentioned some of the work with family justice, but I'm wondering if there's a specific strategy that's been useful for you. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's always a problem, um, particularly other government departments, not necessarily departments within the Ministry of Justice. Um, and that stems from ministers, really. So I think civil servants, we can be as collaborative as we like, but ministers are often actually in competition with, e with each other. Um, and so there's only so much we can collaborate over, actually, in the UK, we find. Um, but there are strategies that we employ, and those strategies are exactly the same, really, for how we work internally as well. So 
you have to offer something in order to collaborate. It's, it can't just be one way. Um, so when we started in the Ministry of Justice, we asked people to start working in different ways or start doing something in a different way. It didn't really work because we were, it was all one way. You have to offer something. So what we try and offer people we work with is people, people's time, people's skills, uh, but also that we're, we're there to help, we're there to be humble, uh, we're not there to change things, we're there to help in the process that exists to offer advice. So in the cross-government departmental kind of context, that means uh, saying that we're you know, broadcasting to a government departments, we're doing this research, and we'll share the findings with you if you guys are interested. And it's really a token of collaboration that can lead to something where people go, okay, yeah, I get these guys just want to work with us. Let's work out how we do that better. Um, and the other thing in the UK context, which is really interesting, I guess, is that um, Brexit really helps. Um, and that's because no one's got any time, no one's got any money, no one's got any uh, parliamentary slots to do anything that isn't Brexit related. And so all of those other things in government, um, which need, which would have needed time, money, people, and legislation, uh, suddenly kind of scrabbling around for what's left. All that means is that when you offer digital or you know digital alternatives or um, people's time, those things become a lot more valuable to people, um, and it, it really creates a better. I think under pressure, that kind of pressure it becomes easier to collaborate actually, rather than harder, which is quite interesting. I think the, the other thing is that you, you still need that senior support, you still need that cover from people. Um, you need to have people who want to collaborate. Um, if you don't have that, it's gonna be really difficult to do because you're gonna be constantly fighting against almost everyone that surrounds you. If it's okay, I have a, another question from Costa Rica again. Um, one of our current hypotheses here is that perhaps if we had a public innovation lab, then that public innovation lab could provide some protection for civil servants within different ministries who want to start doing the sorts of things that you've been describing. Um, perhaps because, you know, you know, there's such a culture of risk aversion that, uh, you know, you, you really do need that protection. And unlike in your ministry, they're not going to get that from their minister or from their boss, direct boss. So I'm just wondering, you know, in the UK, you guys have Nesta, which is a wonderful example of one of these labs around the world. To what extent do you interact with Nesta? Have they been helpful to supporting this kind of work? Or in your case, has it not even been necessary? Um, yeah, that's a really interesting question. Uh, so we've got Nesta, we've got the Design Council, uh, we've got the Policy Lab as well. Um, and, I don't, I don't want to be the naysayer, <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm going to, we haven't had very much interaction with those bodies. Um, and the reason for that is that um, they're really good at set pieces. I think they're really good at showing the value um, in a kind of interactive way. And they get a lot of buy-in to do that, um, which can create a really nice foothold in the department that you're working in. People go, oh, that was really good. We need to do that internally. Um, and, and that has happened in the Ministry of Justice. I think that's actually one of the reasons why we've got support. But um, in the long term, what we, what we find is that those organisations don't really get into the nitty gritty of policy making in the department uh, because they're not responsible for delivery. So they can walk away and kind of go, you guys get on with it now. Whereas we, for example, have got to deliver um, within the department and we've got to deliver when we say we're going to deliver and we've got to do all that yeah. kind of thing. Um, but we, we also can't walk away from projects. So if a minister says, do something, we have to do it. Whereas Nesta, Policy Lab, et cetera, can choose the projects they work on. So they, can, they only really work in projects where the conditions of success, I think, are already there. Um, so I think they're necessary in order to get started, but I think in order to really do it effectively and build uh, the department's capability to do stuff in-house, collaborate uh, in-house in the long term, build a culture, which is about collaboration and openness, then you need those three teams to be in-house, those entrepreneurs really, and to create a space for those people. And have you felt that those three bodies you talked about have have been proactive in helping you build that culture within the Ministry of Justice and other ministries, or has that really happened independently? 
Um, they've got a different mission, I think. They've got a mission okay. which, which is twofold. I think one part of that mission is to um, focus on working on big priority issues across government and introduce design thinking into those spaces. Uh, but the other mission is to try and develop design thinking and policy making as like an academic uh, theory based thing. So they're not really there to build capability or uh, entrepreneurs really. Um, so, so we haven't had that kind of direct support from them. Um, equally, I think we found, I mean, you know, interestingly, as I was describing at the start, the contexts across government are really different as well. So designing for people, you know, doing like applying for a driving license, license is very different for drive, designing for someone who's leaving prison and has a lot of, for example, mental health issues and education issues needs, um, for example. And so really the best people to become good at designing for those user groups of people who have to deal with it. Um, and actually, I think some of the way we work in the Ministry of Justice um, reflects that. Um, whereas some of the practice in the centre is more generalised. Thanks. Thanks. Jack, are there any questions that you wanted to pose to others about the topic that, that you've, been, you've been thinking about? Yeah, we, de we definitely don't have everything right and we don't have we don't know everything uh we we know a little bit of a thing um and i talked about how you know we're collaborating with different disciplines and how our mission is, is about specialists and getting them involved in the right stage but that's within quite a limited field as you can probably see by the specialists that i pulled out in data scientists digital ucd and so i'm really interested to know what other specialist skills people are collaborating with or indeed, what are the skills that people want to work with if, if, if they know that at all? Does anyone have uh, experiences to share on that question? If, if not, we can certainly look into, look into it. Um, I'll bring up another question shared by um, folks beforehand. Um, how, how can we enable collaboration in public systems that are designed to be suspicious of interactions with people out of government? Um, I mean, I'm not sure they are designed to be suspicious of people out of government. Um, I think, where the suspicion comes from is is one of the contexts we've got in the uk is that we've got quite a change of uh quite a churn of ministers the problem with that is that um if there isn't a ministerial direction for something then it's very hard to go out and talk to people about it because the worst thing that can happen to a policy official is that a minister goes uh finds out about a policy idea uh, from a stakeholder whose officials have been talking to um, rather than from his or her own officials. Um, and so there's often a big reluctance to go and engage people um, either in government or out of government where ministers don't have a set direction that they've announced publicly. Um, and difficulty at the moment in the UK is that the ministers are changing so often that they don't necessarily have time to get up to speed and to set a long-term direction uh, within the tenure which they've got in a department. Uh, so that really slows down, we found, the process of collaborating across government. Um, I think the flip side of it though is that whilst ministerial agendas are up in the air, it also it does open up the opportunity to collaborate within government more effectively uh, because it creates more time um, for uh, different departments to work together on, on plans. Uh, and advise ministers more effectively together. Um, so we've been trying to do that a lot more as well. Uh, but I don't think departments are designed to be suspicious. I think it's just the nature of the political environment we're in at the moment. And, and Jack, um, Saris from Wales said that there was some appetite uh, at 
uh, to look at accessing court systems online. Um, do you think that she would be able to point colleagues in, in your direction? Um, and if so, maybe you could just share a little bit more about that work. Yeah, definitely. Um, we've got a court reform program um, in the Ministry of Justice in uh, courts and tribunals. Um, and they're doing some really, really interesting things. Um, they've recently delivered an online dispute resolution platform for small money claims, for example. They're putting divorce online as well. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a really great program of work. Uh, so I'm happy to connect uh, both to me and I can also uh, try and connect you with people within the Corps uh, Transformation program as well. Thank you. Um, I just uh, unmuted as well, but um, also I had a chat with some colleagues. I, I'm a social researcher and um, sometimes I find I get involved in conversations at kind of a late stage and um, I guess we, we are trying as a division to get policymakers to recognise our contribution earlier on, but I think that's what everybody wants to be in the cycle. Um, so everybody wants to be uh, engaged early on. And um, yeah, I, I had another conversation with um, another set of colleagues who were looking to reform kind of advice services to um, delivered by people like Citizen Advice and, um, you know, for homelessness advice and benefits and so on. Um, and they are conscious that face-to-face -face advice is very expensive, um, but trying to kind of encourage them to use different tools and different um, channels is quite difficult. Um, but I guess that's that kind of, you know, user testing that is missing with them maybe and actually sort of getting to the user and um, maybe understanding what drives, you know, users to kind of think about using online versus face-to-face -face channels. Yeah, so um, really interestingly, I think what we found is that uh, ministers and really senior officials absolutely love like social research and user research. Mm -hmm. uh, because ministers, their correspondence bag is just full of, you know, stuff like I went to court and the court system was rubbish and why is it in paper? I need, you know, I, I, I didn't get my letter for whatever reason. And so when you, we've presented stuff back to ministers and said, this is what users are saying, uh, they're always like, yeah, yeah, this makes total sense, total sense. It's for us, it's to get through that middle, middle layer where we can actually present that stuff to, to ministers and, and others. Um, but yeah, we also find that, that often policy teams have got an idea about what the right answer is. Um, and what we try and do is really to kind of get on the train rather than to try and stop the train and divert it. So mm -hmm. where that's the case, we kind of say, okay, you, you've got this idea. Um, let's just like pause for a second and say, what are the assumptions behind that or the hypotheses behind it? And sometimes we just have to jump to that prototyping stage in order to try and basically uh, turn that, that ship around and, and effectively show why those things might not be the best ideas. Yeah, uh, yeah just what you're describing, user, user testing stuff really. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Jack, I'm conscious of, of the time. Um, does anyone else have any other questions um, uh, to conclude? Then, then, um, then maybe Jack, if there are any just final thoughts or, um, or, or things that have been particularly helpful for you based on, based on the discussion, um, just to, just to conclude. Um, yeah, so this is great talking to loads of people about this kind of thing. Um, I'm glad you guys are all interested in it because I think this is really how we can deliver really great public services and deliver better policies. So I think everyone here should just keep doing what we're doing and collaborating. The other really important thing is to share what we're learning because um, certainly in the Ministry of Justice, we don't know all the things. And as I've said, our user group is very specific um, and therefore might not be relevant to everyone. Uh, but the more we can share some of this, the better. So we're gonna try and continue to write blog posts about what we're doing on the Ministry of Justice blog. Uh, try and write stuff for apolitical as well. We've got an event in the Ministry of Justice in June, which I'll share on Twitter and other places as well, which anybody would be welcome to join. We're talking about uh, some of the specific spaces that we've been working in and what we've learned there. Um, and we'll also be joining the CrossGov International Design event 
in I think it's July as well, um, which falls directly after the One Team Gov International Conference. Um, so there's lots of places to get involved, and I'd be great to see you all again at one or more of those. Uh, thank you so much, Jack, and, and everyone else for for uh, attending. And, and we hope that um, would would anyone else would anyone be interested in? Um, I guess this is the first time that we've done something like this, um, and we're wondering what's the best way to keep people connected. I know that, like David, if you have a question from Costa Rica, or Jack, if you have another question, what what is the best way to um, to stay in touch or to uh, kind of keep appraised of have this community of, of people working in the same space. Um, I don't know if, if in other parts of the world people use this, this app, but I'm in several WhatsApp groups that are, that can be helped as long as, you know, people <laughs> limit themselves to not spamming then it can be a helpful way to kind of quickly shoot a question out there and get some useful answers. I guess like from my perspective, Twitter probably is the most like, mutually accessible platform because as you say, WhatsApp, it's a bit more um, intrusive into your attention. Yep. I mostly get WhatsApp from family members and stuff. So it's like, oh, there's a notification and it's like, okay. That's just me, I am not the user. <laughs> That's always the worry, Dominic. Um, uh, but th thank you all. Um, we really appreciate it and um, uh, look forward to having you on Apolitical. We're so grateful to have you and um, we hope you have a great end to your Monday. And thank you, Jack. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, everyone.